All right, so um, we're going to switch modes now, and I'm going to talk about what you do differently when you write for a general audience. I have to say that you're going to, I write for, you know, from the most technical, I write about statistics for scientific articles, you know, all the way, you know, some very, very technical papers to all the way to I wrote a health column for a beauty magazine for a decade. So that's a really, really wide range of audiences. Um, I do more things the same across all of those audiences than I do different. So most of it is just, you know, cutting clutter, writing with verbs, writing clear, crisp prose. None of that changes regardless of audience. And so that's really the foundation of good writing in the audience. In that case, you know, it's, it's regardless of audience. But there are a few things that I do differently. So what I'm going to do now is talk about what are the things I do differently when I write for that general audience rather than for um, those more technical audiences. And uh, what kinds of things do I write about? So I know this is a, today's talk is about online writing. Um, I am, you know, old enough that most of my writing still uh, appeared in print before being online. So uh, I think that's going to switch very, it is switching very quickly is that much more stuff is going to be online and never printed, but I still have a lot of old fashioned publications that printed first and then, and then appear online. So I write um, for general audiences about, I did a, you know, sometimes do profiles of scientists. This one was about a scientist who was working with cells. Um, I love writing about errors in science because I think there's a lot of them. And this one was errors in biomedical computing. Um, I write about research at Stanford. So this one was on science. And then I did write um, a health column for a beauty magazine for a decade. So I wrote about really, really general things like um, obesity, smoking, um, skin care, really, really um, general audience. Um, and so again, it, it's allowed me to think about very carefully about how you target these very different audiences. So the health column, I was writing, you know, uh, picturing, you know, somebody just sitting in a waiting room, leafing through. That's a very different audience than if I'm writing a technical paper. So again, no matter what audience though, you've got to be concise, you've got to be clear and you've got to be engaging and none of that changes. And so in some ways, I think there's way more similarities across all these different audiences than there are differences. But I'm going to focus now on the differences. So here are the things that I think I do differently when I change hats and I write for that more general audience. So one of the main things that you do differently, and this is not a hard skill to master, this is really simple, but it's totally not the way we do things in science, is in, when you're writing for a general audience, <clears throat> you have to start with the take home message. Think about the way we write in science. In, in science, we build up an argument, we start with the background and then the question and the methods, and then we don't get to the take home message, the punchline, until the end of the paper. It's not hard to switch that, but if you're a scientist, you're just not used to starting with the punchline. So you have to learn to start with the punchline first. And I'm going to go through um, each one of these in a minute and give some examples. Another thing is jargon. So we, we already talked a little bit about jargon. You absolutely can put jargon in a scientific paper. It's expected. It's necessary. When you're writing for a general audience, though, you have to think about all the jargon. And I don't just mean autologous tumor-bearing host. That's a type of jargon. Um, but there's also just a way that scientists speak that sounds like jargon to a lay public. And I'll give some examples. So you have to recognize and avoid scientists speak as well. And you have to unpack the science. So when I write for a scientific audience, it's so much easier. It's so much easier to write for a scientific journal than it is to write for a uh, lay public magazine. Um, and the reason is that when I write for a scientific audience, I can assume a certain, you know, they know this statistical test. I don't have to say what it is. I don't have to unpack it. I can assume a certain amount of prior knowledge depending on exactly which, which scientific audience I'm writing for. And I don't have to unpack any of that. And so I can be super lazy as a writer and that makes it easier. Um, when you go to write for a magazine, um, for a really general audience, you have to unpack all that. And I was doing a story a few years back where I talked about pipetting and the editor came back to me and said, you have to explain what it means to pipette. And that was one I just took for granted. I was like, really? People aren't going to know what pipetting is? But nope, I had to sit there and explain what it meant to pipette. It's not easy. <laughs> um, we also talked a little bit about precision already. So one of the key things I do differently when I write for lay public, and this is a really, this is a skill that took me some time to master, is I have to filter out unnecessary details and unnecessary precision. And that letting go, if you're a scientist and those details, that's hard. But if you can learn to do that well, that's a lot of what it means to write for a general audience. 
you also have to get to the point faster. You cannot take your time and go through A and B and C and D. And this is a lot of trusting your reader. So even though you're writing for a non-scientific audience, that doesn't mean they're a dumb audience, right? They're, they're intelligent, they're smart, they can infer a lot of things. You've got to trust that your reader doesn't need you to hold them by the hand and you got to get there faster. And then you guys have already had a workshop in storytelling techniques. So that's great because in writing for general audiences, you're going to use those storytelling techniques. So I'm going to start here by showing um, two abstracts and I'm going to turn them into a lay summary. <clears throat> I excerpted these from a paper in nature and a paper in, in science. And I actually took these abstracts because I thought they were, the scientific writing was actually generally well done. It's good for a scientific audience. But I'm going to show you what we do differently if I was to write this as a lay summary rather than a scientific abstract. So this one was in Nature a few years back, and it says, here we leverage the wide usage of smartphones with built-in accelerometry to measure physical activity at the global scale. We study a data set consisting of 68 million days of physical activity for about 717,000 people, giving us a window into activity in 111 countries across the globe. We find inequality in how activity is distributed within countries and that this inequality is a better predictor of obesity prevalence in the population than average activity volume. I actually think that's not a badly written um, abstract. Like I can understand that. That's perfectly fine for a scientific audience. I'm going to show you, here's my lay summary though down at the bottom. So my lay summary is researchers use data from smartphones to look at the walking habits of 717,000 people from 111 countries. Countries with the widest gaps between the most active and least active people also had the highest obesity rates. Surprisingly, this activity inequality was a stronger predictor of obesity than the total amount of activity. So whoever asked about surprisingly before, <laughs> I've used it right here. So <laughs> I do like that ever. Um, yeah, so you can hear when I read the lay summary, it feels different, right? It has a different feel to it. It's a little bit friendlier. And so I'm going to show you how I got from that original to that lay summary. You can hear the difference, but I'm going to point out all the little techniques that I use. All right, <clears throat> one more example. This one comes from Paper in Science. Again, I think it's some interesting science, pretty well done scientific abstract. Atmospheric water is a resource equivalent to about 10% of all fresh water in lakes on Earth. However, an efficient process for capturing and delivering water from air, especially at low humidity levels, has not been developed. We report the design and demonstration of a device based on a porous metal organic framework it captures water from the atmosphere of it at, at ambient conditions by using low-grade heat from natural sunlight at a flux of less than one sun. This device is capable of harvesting 2.8 liters of water per kilogram of uh, metal organic framework daily at relative humidity levels as low as 20% and requires no additional input of energy. So again, for, for a scientific abstract, I think they've done a pretty good job. This is well targeted at scientists. But here is my lay summary. My lay summary reads, scientists have created a device that can pull water out of the air. Water harvesting devices have been built before, but they were impractical for everyday use because they only worked on extremely moist air or required high amounts of energy to run. The new device contains a porous crystal called a metal organic framework that soaks up water vapor like a sponge. The small solar panel provides the energy needed to condense the water into liquid. A prototype containing two pounds of the crystal extracted 12 cups of water from desert air in one day using only sunlight for power. And notice I didn't get much shorter in that case, but I unpacked some of the science. Claudia writes, I always have trouble when deciding the experimental details to include, like the number of participants, for example. Any thoughts on this? So if you're writing for a lay audience, um, yeah, what details do you include? And we're going we're gonna to talk about that when I talk about filtering out unnecessary details in a minute here. Yeah, it's a little bit of uh, an art, actually, to figure out what details do I need and what details do I not need. And I sort of view it as um, an inverted pyramid. So there's some really important details up top, and then there's kind of the next layer, and then there's a the next layer, and then there's the next layer. And it, those details become less and less important as you filter down. So like if you think about um, in this study here, the important point is they have a device that can pull water out of the air, <laughs> right? And then what, you know, we get into like, how does it work? Well, it uses this porous crystal. That's actually an important point here. So I kept it in, even though it's a little um, technical. Um, and then it can extract, water from the air. But notice I, I filtered out some details about like the exact humidity levels because uh, as a lay reader, I don't really know what 20% humidity means. So just low humidity was all I needed to know there. So it's a little bit of an art of how many layers down of those details do you go? And it depends on the specific general general audience that you're writing for because there are different, there are different general audiences. So I wrote for 
I've written for uh, publications where it was really, really general and then sort of a more scientific audience. And that might also determine how far down in the details I go, as well as the length of the article that I'm writing. Ah, a small question. When writing numbers, when do you write the actual number 12 versus spelling it out to Juliana? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the general rule of thumb is that you're going to write out numbers. Um, you're going to write the words if the number is less than 10. And if the number is 10 or greater, you write the, the numeral. However, it actually depends specifically on the publication that you're writing. Every publication has its own set of style guidelines, and it might vary a little bit by publication. But the general rule of thumb uh, to use is writing out the words under 10 and using the numerals above 10. All right, again, you can hear this lay summary here it has a little bit of a different feel to it. Um, it's a little more reader friendly. So now I'm going to show you how I got from one to the other in both of those examples. So again, starting with the take home message, tell the readers up front why they should care. This is not hard to master, but you really have to think about it because you haven't been taught to write this way in science. Just start with the punchline first. Don't build up an argument. Just tell us why we should care. You need to do this for a lay audience because the lay audience has no reason to read on if they don't know why this is important. So for example, in the one about the, the water device, it started with the background. Atmospheric water is a resource equivalent to less than or about 10% of all freshwater lakes on Earth. That's perfectly fine for a scientific abstract. We always start with the background. Again, we build up to the question. You can't do that in a lay summary. In a lay summary, you've got to start with the most important thing first. So what is the most important thing here? Scientists have created a device that can pull water out of the air. We have to start with the most important detail, the most important fact that sort of the, the meat of uh, the science here. This is the whole point is to pull water out of the air. And, and everybody gets, notice I didn't hear a lot of background here. The lay audience understands that water is a scarce resource. Lay audience already knows that. You don't have to tell your reader that. Um, so the lay audience can infer that it's, this is important because water is scarce. And if you can get water out of the air, that's another source of fresh water. So you actually don't need to give a lot of background here. You can assume your lay reader understands that water is a scarce resource. Uh, Isabel writes, my opinion is that we could do this more in scientific writing as well, putting the take home message in, earlier in an abstract or intro or within a sentence. Uh, Isabel, I love that idea. Yes. <laughs> I do actually wish that we um, put the take home message first a little bit more in science. That's not the way a scientific paper is written, though. And so um, at least because I'm used to reading the scientific literature, I know where to go to look for the things I need. So what do I do when I read a paper? If I'm reading about it because I might write about it for a general audience, I actually do two things. I skip to the end of the introduction section. That's where they're supposed to tell me what the paper's about. The, this is the aims of the paper. And the first paragraph and last paragraph of the discussion section. The first paragraph of the discussion section is supposed to say, we found that and give the main things. And then the last paragraph is supposed to give the implications. So I will often skip down to those things to see if the paper is you know, something that I might want to write about for a general audience. And Juliana says, my, I was actually just taught to do this when writing specific games for a proposal. Maybe we are evolving. Yes. So actually, it's a little different in proposal writing. In proposal writing, you do need to, you're doing a little bit of salesmanship. So it's actually more um, in a proposal, the way we set up specific aims is to give away the punchline first. So that's true. In a proposal or in grant writing, you often do give away the main point first. You don't build up the argument because you have to do a little salesmanship. You're trying to ask them to give you money. So you have to say why it's important right from the for, right from the start. Yeah, it's interesting that we don't do that in scientific manuscripts. Maybe we should do a little bit more of that. Again, starting with take-home message, not a hard skill to master. We're just not used to that in science. So you have to really you know, tell yourself to do that the first 10, 10 times you write for general audience. Uh, Julia says, but does that not bias you when you read the paper? I was taught to look at the data first. Julia, I always do look at the data first when I'm reviewing a scientific paper. First thing I do is I go to the tables and figures. So yeah, I mean, maybe that's a reason that we don't write scientific manuscripts that way is because we want to let the data speak for themselves and kind of go through the whole process and then get to the conclusion. So interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting point. We're wanting to kind of keep an open mind. And that's why I actually don't read what the authors have to say about their own data. I skip to the tables and figures and look at the data for myself. I do that too. Good. These are all great uh, thoughts and questions. 
All right, another thing, so that one's not, not hard, I think, it's just something you have to think about the first kind of times that you write for a general audience. You can't take a lot of time to get to the point, you just start with the point. Um, second one is trickier, recognizing and avoiding jargon, because this doesn't, I don't just mean like metal organic framework, that's jargon, but there's lots of other things in there that's also jargon, it's the way scientists speak and we're used to hearing it, but it's not the way somebody in the lay public will speak, so it's hard. Uh, my, I have a good friend at, at Stanford who's a, a writer at Stanford, she calls these, you know, terms and phrases not found in nature. I think that's a really good way to describe it. Um, and so that one about the smartphones wasn't, there wasn't any real technical jargon in there, but some of the way that it's written is jargon for a layperson. So we say we leverage the wide usage. That's those, so it's not like those are words that a layperson won't understand, but we don't usually talk that way. Accelerometry might be jargon for a layperson. Physical activity rather than exercise, or I use walking habits at the global scale. Again, not these are not hard, big words. It's just that we don't usually speak this way. This is scientist speak. Is distributed. You know, I'm a statistician, so is distributed. I use that all the time, but we don't say that way in uh, for a lay audience. Or the prevalence of obesity. Prevalence is actually a technical term. And my favorite one is the average activity volume. So nobody goes and says, you know, oh, I ran, you know, X volume this week, right? We don't talk about activity volume in a lay person. The lay person's gonna talk about how much, how many steps they got or how, how many hours they ran. They're not gonna talk about activity volume. So that's scientist speak. So you have to start to recognize that that is not the way a lay person talks. And it's hard because the longer you've been in science, the more those terms that I have highlighted there actually sound good to your ear and you don't hear it as jargon. Um, and so notice I got rid of all of that when I wrote my lay summary. I tried to use a little bit more reader friendly. So I just said we use data from smartphones instead of leveraging the wide usage, just we use data from smartphones, right? Uh, I talked about walking habits rather than physical activity. Global scale, I didn't need to say that because it's 111 countries. The reader gets that that's global, right? Um, I cut out obesity prevalence. I just said highest obesity rates that people understand that better and the total amount of activity rather than average activity volume. So just small changes that just make it sound more uh, like we talk in everyday life. The one about the, the water device actually had more jargon in it than the physical activity one. There's a lot of jargon you might've noticed. Uh, atmospheric water, efficient processes, process for capturing delivering water. Again, no real jargon per se in that, but that's scientists speak. We don't say, oh, I developed an efficient process for something. We don't say that in everyday language. Design and demonstration, again, scientists speak. Porous metal organic framework. Now that is true jargon, right? Um, I actually had to look that up because I didn't know what that was. So I had to go to YouTube and I'll tell you that uh, YouTube, Coursera, these are great resources. If you are gonna be writing about science for general audiences, I go and first thing I do is I look for a video. Also, when I'm gonna interview a scientist, I go on YouTube and I try to find a video of them speaking. Scientists often do a better job when they're you know, talking than they do writing. So I went and found a video where it explained what a metal organic framework was so that I could unpack it and write about it for a general audience. Uh, ambient conditions, flux. I didn't know what a flux was. Uh, relative humidity uh, levels, um, liters, liters is jargon because in America, we don't, um, we don't use liters and kilograms, we use pounds and gallons. So you actually have to translate it into US units. So I teach a, a summer career course to postdocs and graduate students who are thinking or you know, contemplating or wanna explore careers in science writing and publishing. And the assignment that we have them do at the end of the course, it's just a two week kind of crash course, is we have them write a, an, an article, a short news article, 500, 600 words for a lay audience. And what happens every year is we tell them, you know, your, your piece is gonna come back and it's gonna be really marked up in red. And they never believe us, but in fact, every piece goes back marked up in red. Um, they are trying to write for a lay audience. That's the assignment. We say, okay, you're gonna write for a lay audience. They can't do it because they've been in science so long that they're no longer hearing any of this as jargon. So you guys have also been in science so long. Some of the things that you take for granted, that's jargon to uh, a lay person, but you've probably forgotten it's jargon. Um, <laughs> perfect length for a, a guest blog entry. <laughs> yes. 
Um, so here's an example of something a student handed in. Um, and we just go through, we literally highlight all the things that are jargon to a lay person. So they were talking about prions. It was a really interesting story about prions. But he said, uh, gain of function. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Even though gain of function sounds so normal to your ear because you've been in science so long, gain of function, that's scientist speak. Even prion, what's a prion? Most lay people don't know that. Aberrant process, confined to the space of disease, natural conformation changes, stochastically. I love the term stochastically. I'm a statistician, but we don't use that in everyday language. Are induced by adaptive mechanism, alternate conformations. So all these kind of all this kind of language that you totally take for granted, you gotta go back and think it, you know, and until somebody points it out to you, it's actually really hard to hear that as jargon um, from your area. So that's a little bit of a trick. Uh, in writing for general audiences, you've got to start recognizing that jargon. Really helpful tip is to go talk to somebody who's outside of your little niche area. And when you start talking with them, you'll realize just how much of what you're saying is jargon. Gidalia writes, trying to explain something to a non-scientist family member is a great exercise for this. My wife isn't a scientist and we usually have to go through four or five rounds of simplification before I get all the jargon out. That is a great point. Um, yeah, talk to somebody in your family about it who is not a scientist or is not even just outside of the scientific area that you're in. And if you start to talk it out, it's a really great way to hear all the jargon because that person is going to say, wait, wait, stop. <laughs> you just lost me. They're going to go back and forth. My husband won't let me do that anymore. I, I've like used up all of my, uh, he used to read things for me, but he got bored of it after a while. But yeah, if you can find somebody who, um, is outside of science in order to try to explain these things to you. That's a really, really helpful tip. And just talking about your science is also very helpful. Matthew writes, uh, many new researchers struggle to learn how to read like an academic. How much do you think scientists speak contributes to this? Um, yes, uh, a lot, Matthew. I think we do a terrible disservice to young scientists and that we scare a lot of people out of science um, because we write so poorly in science. And so one of the things I like to tell young researchers is if you're reading a paper and you can't understand it, your instinct is to think that the problem is with you. Oh, I haven't learned enough. I'm not smart enough. Nope, <laughs> I'm old enough now and wise enough now. I used to think that when I was a young scientist, but now when I read a paper that I can't understand, I immediately assume that the problem is with the authors and not me. So as young scientists, you should assume that too. If you can't understand it, the problem is not with you. It's with the authors that have not done a good job uh, of writing. Sonia writes, uh, pro tip, switch out the person. They will eventually learn your field's jargon. <laughs> Uh, child of economics professor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you have to, you can't use the same person for too long or then they know all your jargon. Exactly. Uh, Matthew, how might we change this to lower the barriers of entry to science or should we change it? Um, I think we um, are actually keeping a lot of great smart people out of science by the way that we communicate and write in science. And again, I think it has to do with this kind of elitist culture that we're going to use really big fancy words um, and if you don't need know the big fancy words, then, you know, you're not part of the club. Um, so I personally think, um, we really need to change this in science. We need to write clearer. Um, and I do sometimes feel like, uh, we write in this really jargon filled way as a, as a form of job security, right? If I write it really hard and nobody else can understand it, then nobody can take my job. Um, uh, well, you know, Maybe there's somebody who could do your job better, uh, who just is, is intimidated by the way that we talk in science. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of pushing that we should write to the broadest audience possible and we should try to get, I mean, so the scientific literature is just so poorly written. And I can say this having worked in both realms of professional writing and scientific writing. Um, professional writing is well written, scientific writing is not. And I don't think that says anything good about us as scientists or that, uh, that we're somehow smarter. I think it makes us not smarter if we can only write in jargon. Um, so uh, there's lots of culture change that needs to happen in science and academia. I could talk about that for, for a long time, but you guys are the young scientists. So you guys are the ones who have to make that change. Um, and if we want to increase diversity in science, for example, that's a topic of discussion right now. I think we got you know all of this writing and really arrogant and jargon filled, uh, non-understandable language doesn't help. So good. All right. So we, but it's hard when you're used to seeing it, it's very hard to get it out of your own writing. So it takes some amount of practice. And again, yeah, talking with somebody, sharing your writing with somebody outside of your discipline can really help. 
All right, another thing you have to do when you're writing for lay audiences is you have to unpack the science. And this is hard. Uh, you know, you can take so many things for granted. When I write for a journal, I don't have to unpack any of this stuff. And it's like I was, uh, you know, doing kind of a technical paper maybe a year or two ago. And I was like, this is so easy compared to me trying to explain this for a general audience. Uh, because I could just use the crutch of a lot of this jargon and assumed knowledge. You can't do any of that when you write for a general audience. You have your, your audience may not know some of the basic scientific concepts that you're taking for granted, and you need to explain it. And it's really hard to explain it without hand waving. <laughs> that is, you have to understand the science almost better in order to be able to explain it to a general audience. So I actually feel like I come away when I have to write something for a general audience, I come away with it understanding it better than if I had written about it for a scientific audience. Um, so for example, this metal organic framework that teamed up in the science one, I didn't know what that was. I'm not a chemist. I had to look that up. I, like I said, I went to a YouTube and I found a few videos on it. And so then I had to, in order for me, able, me to be able to write about it for a general audience, I had to learn what it was and I had to really understand how it works. So I needed like a picture and I needed to understand that this mechanism, because I didn't, when it says a device based on porous metal organic framework that captures water, I didn't have a good picture of what that looked like in my head. I couldn't put it together or draw a picture or tell you. So that means I didn't really understand it. I kind of have this vague concept of it. In order for me to write about it for a lay audience, I had to go and find a picture. I had to say, okay, this is this piece connects to that piece. And this is what a metal organic framework actually is. And like, I have to understand the whole thing. So um, what I came up with was it's a, the new device contains a porous crystal. So that's what a metal organic framework is. It's porous, so it soaks up water like a sponge. And then, a small solar panel. Okay, there's this little solar panel that's connected to the porous crystal. I had to unpack and understand all that myself before I could explain it in a concrete way for the for the lay audience. So it's a lot of actually when I write for general audiences, a lot of me going back down and figuring out the basic science. Um, I, I was doing a story a few years back, um, and the key point of the story was the difference between analog and digital. This was like a key theme of what this researcher was doing. And I sat down to write that story and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to explain to my reader what is the difference between analog and digital. And I can't tell you how hard that was. <laughs> so for me as a statistician, when I think analog versus digital, I think continuous variable versus discrete variable. And so that's what I sat down the first time I went down to write it. That's what I wrote in my paper. And then I was like, oh, my editor is absolutely going to hate this because continuous versus discrete doesn't mean anything more to a lay person than analog versus digital. So I, I spent hours trying to think of like, how do I explain it? I had to go back and think through even what digital versus analog means, all these concepts that I kind of take for granted. So what I came up with in this case was, I was talking about um, the, the difference here. Biology's power budgets are incredibly low compared with computers. The key is that biology uses a combination of analog and digital computing, whereas computers are almost exclusively digital. The point that I was trying to make was that the analog actually saves you space and time and energy compared to the digital, but the digital is more precise. So I was trying to come up with an analogy for that. So what I came up with is to understand the trade-offs, Consider how one might add graded lighting to a room. The analog solution is to use a dimmer switch, right? It's one switch, <laughs> very efficient, but it's imprecise. You're not always gonna get the exact same amount of lighting. A digital solution would be to install 10 light bulbs, each with its own on and off switch, right? You could get that very precise control over your lighting. However, you know, you'd have 10 light bulbs on your wall with 10 switches. So that was trying to illustrate the, the trade-offs between analog and digital and also getting across the difference between those two. That took me a while to come up with. And I really had to think about, yeah, what does analog versus digital mean? Uh, I was editing something for, for a student and in her first draft, she wrote, different brain regions are connected by cables called neural projections. The team used the new method to study specific neural projections in the mice's brains. So I wrote back to her on the first draft, what's a neural projection? I don't know what that is. So you gotta unpack that for me. And uh, she sent it back. And in the second draft, it still said neural projection. So I wrote again and I said, you know, what is a neural projection? So the third draft, she wrote back to me and she said, oh, I don't know what that is. That's just the term the scientists use. And I said, aha, okay. So that's a problem. If the scientist is throwing around a term that you don't know, you don't get to just stick it in your story and assume your reader is going to understand it. If you don't understand it, your reader is not going to understand it. 
So it turned out she was just talking about axons, but we had to go back and forth to figure out that that's what neural projections mean. So you don't get to just hand wave and throw in scientific terms and not explain them or not understand them. You really have to unpack that science. It, it's, it's, it's work. All right, another key skill on writing for lay audiences, and this is probably the hardest skill to master, I think, and it took me you know, years to really get good at this, but it's that filtering out of unnecessary detail. Uh, there's a certain level of precision that goes into a scientific article, right? You have to put in what statistical test you used and you know, the brand of the weighing scale you use. A lay audience doesn't need that level of precision. It's absolutely important for a scientific article because the scientific article, in order for it to be reproduced, you need every single little detail in there. Um, but the lay audience doesn't, that's not gonna mean anything to lay audience, which brand of weighing scale you use, they don't care. It doesn't, doesn't affect their understanding. So you have to learn to filter out unnecessary details. This is hard for scientists because we love our details, right? It's very hard to get rid of some of these details. Um, Juliana says, uh, especially when unpacking the science, do you get a chance to use pictures or diagrams in your lay writing? That is a fantastic question, Julianne. So um, I generally don't make my own pictures, um, but often when you're writing for magazines, they have people whose job it is to make pictures. And so um, you'll sometimes work with an illustrator um, to come up with a, a good illustration. And you're right that sometimes an illustration is so much easier for somebody to understand than text. Um, this is a good tip for scientific articles too, is to, can you come up with a really good picture? You guys did a course on data visualization, right? That's another one. Like can you come up with a picture that conveys the idea. Often a picture is so much better than text. Um, but when you're writing for lay audiences, often for a professional publication, there's somebody whose job it is to do that. So luckily you're like, I don't have to do the illustration because I'm not good at drawing. Um, but that really is a trick is to thinking about a visual that can convey the idea. Um, and if you're good at that, that's a that's a such an important uh, skill. All right, so these filtering out details, this is this again tricky. Um, the mark of a good story for me is how much I leave on the cutting room floor. So if I know I've done a good job on a study on a story when there's a lot of things that I think are important or cool that I left on the cutting room floor and didn't make it into the story. That's a mark that I've done a good job on. So just a couple of examples from those examples I gave you. In the physical activity one, they talked about 68 million days of physical activity for 717,000 people in 111 countries. Be careful because numbers, uh, you know, people, you don't want to overwhelm a lay reader with too many numbers that they have to remember. So we didn't need all three of those. And which of those is kind of the least familiar? A day of physical activity? That's a little bit harder for people to understand. The point here is just to convey that this was a big study across a lot of countries. So I dropped the 68 million days of physical activity. We didn't need all three of them. So that's a level of precision or detail that I could filter out. And then there was a bunch of details that I filtered out from the science uh, article. So the atmospheric water is a resource equivalent to 10% of all fresh water. That's actually kind of an interesting detail. And if I had more room, that might come up like later in an article for a lay person that like, hey, our atmosphere contains 10% you know, of all the water in, in, in lakes. I didn't have room for it here, but it wouldn't belong at the beginning. It would be lower down in the article. The 20% humidity doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not somebody who thinks in humidity. Um, obviously, the scientific formula, we can filter that out. Uh, sun, the, the unit of a sun, I don't know what that is, so I'm going to filter that out. Um, so we're going to filter out some of those precise details that just don't mean anything to me as a lay reader. They're not necessary. They don't help me as a lay reader to understand the science any better. Uh, that's again not sacrificing accuracy it's just sacrificing precision you can just say low humidity and people get it if you say humidity of 20 percent, people are trying to figure out in their head what that means and i don't look at my humidity meter every day and think about it and, I, and again like kilowatts and stuff people don't know what that is so filtering out some of those unnecessary details just makes it more reader friendly all right another skill is getting there faster so scientists we we spend a lot of time building arguments. We kind of take our time and we meander and then we put in all these details. Um, when you're writing for a lay audience, they're not going to stick with you if you take too long. And you do not need to lead your reader by the hand. You don't need to hold your reader's hand and say, now I'm going to tell you about X and then I'm going to tell you about Y. You've got to trust that even if your reader doesn't know the science, they're quick. They can make inferences. And so don't, you know, you've got to trust your reader a little. So here is 
an example, um, you got to cut to the chase. So in the original, on this one on physical activity, they took two sentences to talk about what the study did. They used smartphones to study 68 million days of physical activity. They did this in two sentences. Here we leverage the wide usage of smartphones. So they're saying we use smartphones, that was one sentence, and then we use those smartphones to create this data set. So that's fine for a scientific art or abstract. It took a little time getting there. We can't take that long getting there <laughs> for the lay audience. You gotta get there quicker. So you can combine all that. You can get all the same information in half the space by saying researchers use data from smartphones to look at the walking habits of 717,000 people from 111 countries. I just compacted it, got out the main point quickly. This is not the most interesting point for the reader. So you wanna to get to it quickly. That's just like, what was the study design? Get it, get it out quickly. The more important point for the lay reader is what you found. Um, so you can just, you can trim things like that and cut out unnecessary details and get to the point faster. So here's something that uh, I was editing for a student a few years back. And they wrote, uh, they were writing about this set, set up in mice where you could connect the taste bud on the tongue to different receptors in the brain so that bitter taste would taste sweet and sweet taste would taste bitter. It's kind of cool science. Um, and she'd already explained this, but then she got to the part where she was explaining the experiment that verified that they had correctly done the rewiring. And she wrote, in order to examine if this rewiring led to changes in behavior, so she's giving us, here's the objective of the experiment. Researchers observe the amount of time mice lick certain bitter or sweet tasting chemicals. Now she's giving us the methods. Now she's gonna give us some results. Mice whose bitter taste buds had been altered seem to have more of a tolerance for bitter taste as they licked bitter quinine more than mice that did not have altered taste buds. So we're getting both the results and the meaning of those results, the discussion. So we can see she's following the standard scientific order. I had a hypothesis, here's how we tested it, here's the results, this is what it means. For the lay audience, the main point of including this was just to show that the rewiring worked. And so you can actually get all of that in with one sentence. So I rewrote that to the mice with the altered bitter taste buds, licked quinine, a bitter substance, more than control mice. Now I've made a few inferences in there. I didn't tell the reader, hey, we did this experiment where we gave mice access to these to the quinine, I didn't need to. That is inferred by the fact that if I say the mice lick the quinine more than the control mice, you immediately as a reader, you know that we, we gave mice access to quinine, right? And we counted up how often they did it. I don't need to go through the whole scientific process of going through hypothesis, methods, results, discussion. I can just say it all in one sentence. You gotta trust that your reader can make those little inferences and those little connections and you can get there faster. That's easier on a lay audience because again, this might not be the most interesting part of the story for them. This is just verifying that, it's, that the, the rewiring worked. You can do it in one sentence. All right, the final thing that's actually a lot of fun in writing for general audiences is that you get to use your storytelling techniques. And again, you guys have had a workshop in this already, so I don't need to belabor this, but you get to appeal to the senses, focus on characters, little drama and suspense. That's you know, something you don't get to do in scientific writing. So this is the fun part of writing for lay audiences. So I was writing a story a while back. I, my editor asked me to write a story about a plant scientist. And I have to admit when she assigned this to me, I was like, ah, plant science, that's boring. You know, it's not something that I would normally be, be very interested in. Um, but when I called up the scientist to say, hey, can I interview you? She's like, oh, well, why don't you come interview me in the morning in my cornfield where I do my genetic experiments. So I met her at like six in the morning and like she ended up being so cool and the science ended up being so cool i didn't expect to be interested in it but it was so cool being out in the lab um and when we were out there and i was talking with her there was this like instant when like all the corn became blanketed with birds and it was just like one second there was no birds and then the whole thing was burnt and i was like whoa what just happened so she explained to me that there's this little um insect that comes out when the air hits a certain temperature and as soon as that comes out that insect comes out the ladybugs come out and then the birds come out and so it, i left there knowing that that was going to be the lead of my story was i, I was going to be able to paint this picture of her lab her outdoor lab um so i'm talking about how she peels the the corns and then all at once the field awakens with life as birds suddenly blanket the plants when the air hits a certain temperature while blood explains Tiny bugs called aphids start moving. They draw the ladybugs, which in turn draw the birds. There's lots of life on life out here. She had that great quote. So I was able to like set the scene of her science and that really draws the reader in and it makes it interesting. I'm not normally interested in plant science, uh, but I was interested in this because of her cool lab and just that she was a cool woman. 
Um, and then, you know, I had a character in the story too, because as I started talking with her, it turned out she was a sort of a pioneer of women in science. And so she was telling me this whole story about, she went to Stanford and studied biology. She then went to Yale for her doctorate. Um, Yale was still an all male college. And so she was telling them sort of all the biases that, that women faced. And this is the story she had it was on her first day, the department head was proudly announced at Yale that about half of the incoming class of biology graduate students was female. And he says, isn't this wonderful? Because there's no better combination than a male professor with a PhD wife to run his lab, right? And so that's, that's what it was. This is in the 1960s. Um, but it was just such an interesting story. Uh, that's how it was viewed back then. Um, and so I was able to get some of that into the story. And that, you know, in the course of writing about her and all, you know, her lab and everything, I got in some science about oxygen and, and corn and genetics. Uh, but it was, you know, it's that, that science alone is not that exciting. I mean, it's important science, but it, it's hard for a lay reader to get into that science. But when you put all this other stuff around it, it suddenly brings out the interesting parts of the science. Um, I'll just quickly mention Twitter. So I've become a fan of Twitter over the last few years. Um, it can be a time sink, which is why I avoided it for a long time. Um, but I do think Twitter is quite useful for scientists because it is a way to communicate with other scientists and with um, even with lay audiences. And so just a quick overview, if you haven't used Twitter yet, if you've been resisting it, um, again, I was resisting it because new technology always costs time and I knew it would be a time sink. Um, but I have to say that I have actually now written papers and given talks with people that I met on Twitter. So for from an academic perspective of wanting to broaden your collaborations and collaborate with people outside of your university, it's a really good tool for that. Um, I'm just showing you an example tweet here. So one of my students had to defend his thesis over Doom uh, during the pandemic. And he had a great turnout. He had like 80 people on Zoom. That's like the biggest dissertation defense I've been at. It was on Zoom. But so the advantage of Zoom is, you know, people from all over could come and see his defense. Um, another one of my former students is great on Twitter. And so he immediately, you know, tweeted it out. Uh, so just to show you the parts of uh, Twitter, always great to put an image or a video that really increases traffic if you have some visual there. So this was his uh, sort of slide of his research history. Um, you can put handles, so the little at and then the person's Twitter handle, that tags them. So I'm going to see this tweet came by my notifications. I'm going to see it um, so that I knew about this tweet and that I could retweet it. And then you have hashtags. And so again, when I was learning about Twitter, I didn't know what any of this was. So some of you may all knew what this is, but this was all new to me when I learned about Twitter. This is hashtags for like, okay, if somebody follows certain topics, causal inference, HIV, then that this will show up in their um, streams as being something that might be of interest because of the topic. And so um, there's a quick little introduction to Twitter, but really useful for, for getting your papers out, for communicating with broader audiences. Writing um, a tweet is also a really good exercise in learning to write short because you have only 280 characters. That'll really challenge you to actually learn how to be concise. Um, and then there's entity uh, like Stanford, you might know, start department at Stanford has its own handle. So you might want to tag an entity like that. All right, we do have an exercise plan for breakout rooms. I realize we're running a little bit long here. So I might just leave that for you guys to do um, later. Um, and want to make sure we have enough time with questions. But this is just a little exercise in writing for lay audiences and writing a tweet. Um, you probably found me through my massive open online course, Writing in the Sciences. So if you want like lots more of the type of training I talked about today, you have a much longer course. You can access all of that for free on Coursera. You don't have to pay for the certificate to get any of the training materials. And uh, since I also do teach statistics and sometimes uh, graduate students also need statistics, I do have a certificate program in that at Stanford. And if you want to find those, you can just Google me and you'll, and those will um, come up. And I think I will... Yeah, and, th and thank you. Amanda sent a link for the breakout room activity prompt. So something you can try on your own afterwards or maybe with some of your peers just for fun. Um, and I'm going to stop my share here and we have just a little bit of time for questions. Sorry, we ran a little bit long there. So if, if you want to ask questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and just jump right in. I think there's a small enough group that 
we won't be all uh, interrupting each other or type in the chat. And I am also happy to stick on the line at the end of the talk. If anybody has any individual questions, you know, about careers in science writing or anything, I'm happy to like hang out for a few minutes. Uh, I don't, I have a class at 1030, but I've got a few minutes there. Um, and I see that there's a poll you guys need to fill out as well in the chat, but um, feel free to jump in with questions or to stick around. Uh, Juliana says, how did you get started writing for magazines? Is this a job you apply for? Okay, great question. So how I got into it is after I finished my PhD, I decided that I wanted to get out of academia and um, become a full-time science journalist. So there is a wonderful science writing program at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where they teach scientists how to be journalists. So if you are considering a career in science writing, that is a really great program to learn to be a science journalist. So I went off and I was a science journalist. I got to write as a science writer from Antarctica for a bit of time. I wrote for Science News. Um, I somehow fell back into academia, though, because it, I have to admit, it's nice to have a day job. Um, and so it was fun for me to be able to do a mix of academia and, and science writing. But that's how I got started. And then the way you get jobs at magazines is uh, it's often a lot of like contacts. And so because I'd done the program at UC Santa Cruz, um, I then was on the right email list for this magazine or I contacted this editor. And then once, you know, when you first contact an editor and first work with them, just do a really good job the first time, show them that you're reliable, and then you tend to get long-term relationships with editors. So I wrote for the same publication for a long time because uh, it was good about meeting deadlines and things. Um, so yeah, you don't really, I mean, you, the way you get started writing for magazines, you could apply for a job, a full-time job in a magazine. For freelance writing, you tend to just contact the editor and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in writing about X, Y, or Z, and then you develop a relationship with them. I did apply for the job at Allure Magazine, and um, that one was a great uh, interview because it was a test, and so they gave you a little test, basically, to, to write a column, and so I just, you know, I, I read the magazine carefully and made sure I did it in their style, and that's how I got that job. Um, how has it been balancing research and science writing? Is this viewed as negative by your chair? Would you recommend doing a mix of academia and science writing to people on the tenure track process? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so for me, um, I did not, like I said, I did not want to be in academia when I left grad school. I was out. I was done. I did not have a great experience. Um, I somehow found my way back into academia, though, because what I realized is a lot of the things you do in science writing it's the same thing that you do in teaching. So I do a higher percentage of teaching than most people. So I actually fund myself on teaching rather than grants. It's a little bit unusual at a place like Stanford. There are not a lot of people who do that. Um, I might have, you know, maybe a dozen. Um, the balancing research and science writing, um, I, but for me, I, I didn't want to do a purely academic job. I didn't want to be writing grants, writing papers. I, that was, that was going to bore me and I knew that. I also decided not to take a full-time job at a science writing, you know, as a science writer, because I thought I would also get bored at that. So what I love about my job is like, sometimes I'm analyzing data. Sometimes I'm writing, you know, about beauty for a magazine. I like that variety. Um, I don't know how it's viewed by my chair. I have a new chair. I guess I'll find out soon. <laughs> um, but I've survived this long. Let's put it that way. Um, I think one good thing about if you have a broad skill set, um, like all the things I learned about science writing helps me teach better. And then teaching is a useful skill from the point of view of my chair. Um, so I always think having a broader skill set is always a good thing. And being able to analyze data, that helps me as a journalist because journalists need to know about data. So by having a broad skill set, I think you can just never go wrong. Um, let's see, there's another question. Uh, Matthew, some students fear that once they leave academia, they won't be able to come back. Did you struggle to reintegrate into academia after being outside of it? So I wasn't out for that long. Um, and um, one piece of advice I always have for students is don't try to plan anything. I didn't plan absolutely anything in my career and it was all just fine. The reason I found myself back into academia was because I was finishing up uh, an internship at Science News and I knew I was coming back to California and I didn't have a job or health insurance yet. The night before I was getting on the plane to go back to California, my uh, a professor from my old department at Stanford called me up and said, hey, you know, we have this class that we need taught in the fall. Any chance you could come in and teach this for us? And since I have a job or health insurance, I was like, sure, that sounds great. I'll work half time teaching and I will freelance write. And that's what I was planning to do. 
But um, once I got there, I saw that all those science writing skills were very applicable to teaching statistics to non-math people. And so I made myself useful and, um, and then I stuck around. Um, and so the reintegration was, um, was fine for me because this is the key, is I knew by then what I didn't want to do. And so I was very clear when they hired me, I said, I want to do this and this, and I don't want to do this. I did not want to write grants. Um, I wanted to teach writing. I wanted to do writing for magazines. And because I kind of fell into the position and they were sort of letting me sort of create it as I went along, I was able to be very clear about what I don't like doing. And so probably the number one thing about choosing a career is know what you don't like doing and avoid that. And I think I was very good at that. I figured out what I didn't like about academia and I avoided that at all costs. So that, that's good advice. It's sometimes it's about um, you know, avoiding things you don't like doing. And again, I'm happy to, yeah. Do you have any experience using science communication and advocacy? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I haven't done too much of that. I would say the only advocacy that I have done really is, um, you know, trying to advocate for, for scientists to write, to write clearer and use statistics better. So trying to clean up what we do as scientists, um, but not like, uh, you know, we, we've got to fix climate change or something like that. Um, so I don't have so much experience in that, but I think that is super important. And there are so many problems facing the world that need scientists to be willing to play that advocacy role. And so um, I think that's going to become increasingly important for you guys as young scientists. 